Campaign 2020 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association Quick Trip Wisconsin Counties Association Wisconsin Realtors Association and Wisconsin Operating Engineers Local 139 State Representative John Jagler of Watertown is a Republican seeking re-election in the 37th Assembly District. The election is November 3. John, welcome back to Wisconsin Eye. Always nice to talk to you, Steve. Thank you for having me. I often ask incumbent legislators if they're re-elected top priority in the next session. Uh, right now, it's getting the state back on co uh, from the bounce back on COVID, uh, not only from a health perspective, but also from a business perspective and, and getting the state open up again. And and uh, you know, helping some of the people that are hurting right now. We're gonna, we're gonna have a lot more people um, still without a job. Unemployment's been a, 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 an, an absolute nightmare. Um, our office is spending probably more time dealing with that than we've ever had on any issue of trying to guide and navigate people uh, to find some, you know, some unemployment and to, and to get some of the things they need. So the bounce back from, from COVID is, is um, something that, you know, when, when you, when I first ran several terms ago, it, <laughs> you never thought we'd be dealing with a pandemic, but th that's the, the interesting thing. And the best thing about this job is diving into issues that you didn't know about and, and learning more. And, and unfortunately, we all know more about this than we care to. So John, um, uh, this is a very timely issue because just about an hour ago, I got a press release from all the Democrats on joint finance saying Republicans haven't met in 167 days You've done nothing to go back in a session to fight COVID. Um, could I just get your response to something the Democrats just said? Well, I mean, we, we have to say that we haven't done anything is is not true. I mean, you look at some of the things from the very first days of of uh, the shutdown of dealing with with companies. Can they be open? Can they? I mean, that has been priority number one is is to keep making people. Uh, you know, come back to, uh, can they come, can they stay open? Navigating that and, and, yeah. and going through the landmines of just that, then the unemployment issues and things like that. I mean, we've kept it up to our local health departments uh, here here in uh, Jefferson County, Dodge County, Dane County, Columbia County, stay in contact with them. Uh, just because we're, we're not uh, banging the drum and, and doing some some legislation to, to I don't know, for the sake of legislation, doesn't mean we're not, we're not active and certainly helping our constituents. Okay, thanks for responding to those finance Democrats. Let's stay on the pandemic though. Yeah. Last week's uh, order by the governor extending the, uh, the, the mask edict to November 21, do you support or oppose that? Well, I, it's not, to me, it never has been about the masks. I mean, the, the, the first order went in, it was 60 days. It's, I can tell you for, depending on where you are in, in the district I represent, it's either extremely unpopular or people just kind of in Dane County, particularly the forest area, they've been used to it, they go with the flow. But to me, it's, it's the extensions. Uh, first, the first extension uh, is just, it's, it's not lawful. I, I, and to me, it's about checks and balances and it never was about the masks. I, I was very, very frustrated that the governor without contacting the legislature other than the morning of calling our, our legislative leaders and saying, we're gonna extend it and doing it again. So to me, uh, it's been unlawful and I wish we would have had that conversation. When you talk about us not being in, well, if we're not invited to the table, how, how can we, we have, a, have a role here when, when the governor is just doing this by edict? So to me, it's been an unlawful extension and, and, and I look forward to, to the results in the in court. If the pandemic, uh, let me make up a number. If the pandemic resulted in uh, the state collecting a billion less in GPR taxes, um, tough options, uh, cut spending or raise some taxes and fees. Where well, are you on that? I, I, I mean, my, my baseline, I think, you know, Steve, is, is to not raise taxes uh, and not raise fees. I mean, unfortunately, you know, one of the things that uh, we're in compared to other states, we're in a lot better shape than other states. Uh, the rainy day fund, you know, when, when I first was uh, elected, it was basically non-existent. It wasn't real. It was, it was, a, it was there, it was a fund, but it, it certainly couldn't have gotten us through a shower, let alone a rainy day. 
And we've been adding and adding and adding to that. So we're in, in much better shape. You look at some of the tax collections coming in. I, I think uh, I think we're going to be able to weather this storm. Um, but I, I mean, belt, belt tightening has already started. I, I think you're going to have to see that coming through. But yeah, I mean, that's my baseline is, is, to, is to not raise taxes or fees. Have you signed on to Representative Bourne's bill that says if you're a charity or an organization or a business and you've adopted COVID-19 protocols, you can't be sued over COVID-19? Absolutely, uh, and and it was one of those, you know, as you know, we're, we're there's probably a good shot that we don't even come back in and hear this bill. We might, I don't know. Um, so anytime the legislation comes in in that, that kind of the lull period, I, I'm always a little skeptical on it. Is it a, is it a press release bill? Is it a, a political bill? Uh, is it real? Is it something that, that, that people want? Well, after talking with businesses um, in, in my area, it's certainly something they want. They're like, look, if we follow the protocols, you know, we're, we're on the line here. Uh, can you help us? And not only, it's interesting, you mentioned the charitable angle. There's, there's just some, even some 4-H groups on, on thinking about their fairs coming up on the next, the next uh, summer. You know, can, can we do this? Or can we even go through with going back to some of the, the ways of life that, that we all cherish and hold dear in Wisconsin? And if they're, if they're nervous about being hit with a frivolous lawsuit, they're not going to be able to do this. So I absolutely did sign on, and I look forward to hopefully getting some, some action on it. The, the role played by hospitals nationally in Wisconsin, we've seen uh, higher increases in the number of Wisconsin hospital beds that filled with COVID-19 patients. Um, if you're voting on the next state budget, do hospitals deserve an even bigger priority than they may have in the current one? Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and you know, I was very supportive of, of the health care spending in the last budget. It was, uh, yeah, I don't know the, the exact figures. You'd have to get uh, uh, Representative Nigren on to, to give you the exact number. I don't have it in front of me, but it was a little, one of the largest increases ever uh, when it comes to spending on health care, whether it's our hospitals or our nursing homes. That was a priority for me when, when uh, we first looked at the budget go around. But now, you know, the hospitals, the, the, the hospitals in my area that I've, I've, I've talked with uh, quite often during all this, they've been there dealing with this from the very beginning and they've been extremely helpful. And even the hospital association, that, that uh, website that we all follow that keeps track of hospitalizations has been extremely, extremely helpful. That's something they didn't have to do. Uh, I think it came out of a, a lack of um, clear statistics from the state and from the feds on, on where we're at with hospitalizations. And to be honest, that dashboard has been the, the one thing that I daily check because the, the cases go up with tests uh, that number can fluctuate, but the, you know the whole point of the initial lockdown was to slow the curve to not overwhelm um, hospitals, and and that was I think everybody understood that. Now we're starting to see some uh, an uptick, and, and that's very very disturbing. And and you talk from initially, uh, whether it's a Columbus Hospital, a Watertown Hospital, uh, and others that I speak to regularly, you know at first it was PPE and and making sure they were taken care of. Now it's, it's how are you doing? What, pro, what procedures are you doing? Are you doing better treating it? The, 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 the way they treat COVID is, is decreased the hospitalization stay. They're learning more and more as they go. And, and yeah, it should be a priority. And it should also should be the dish payments too, that, that we, uh, we should sustain those as well and, and add to them in the next coming budget. Because it certainly, um, it doesn't look like, uh, unfortunately, it's gonna go away you know, as, 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 like, as fast as we'd like it to. The debate over policing reforms, which played out over the last five months, the speaker's got, going to form, a, and Mr. Steinecke going to form a task force. The governor's got nine bills. Senator Wangard has seven or eight. The Black Caucus and the uh, Police Association have their own bills. Are there any specific policing reforms that you'd like to see enacted into law? Well, you know, the, 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 just on the on the politics of it, Steve, it was. You know, when you, anytime, and, and I, I was I was among them, when you hear Blue Ribbon Task Force, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I, I, as a member of the media, that always made me roll my eyes. But having been through it now, I mean, I've been on the Speaker's Task Force, the first one on, on mental health. I also served on the Mental Health Task Force on Alzheimer's and dementia. What a valuable process that is to kind of lay politics aside and have some good comfort. So I'm, I'm very glad we're taking that approach as opposed to 
just running in with a series of bills that haven't been vetted, that haven't been talked about with, with the people uh, that they directly involve or that they're trying to help, I think was, was the wrong approach. So I do like the fact that, that the makeup of this task force is gonna be broad and we're gonna be getting some, some ref, uh, reform discussions going. There's a few things I think we can do. Um, I, I'm not in favor of the uh, blanket ban on no-knock warrants, for instance, but I think there's, there's legislation from other states that we can kind of craft and model. Uh, maybe it's limitations on them. Maybe not, not allow no-knocks in cases of only um, narcotics, for instance, which a lot of them, you know, th that's where a lot of them stem from. Maybe, you know, you don't, I don't want to take that tool away uh, that, that they, they perhaps are, might be necessary at some point, just a blanket ban on no knocks is not appropriate. I think we should look at incentivizing body cams more than ever before uh, for, for the sake of, of everybody. I, I did a couple of ride alongs with law enforcement here, um, including in, in the city I live in, Watertown. It was like, they're constantly recorded. And, and I said to the officer, what do you think of that? And he said, you know, at first it was weird, uh, but it helped him. He said he, he got accused of something right away. A uh, lady said, if, if you don't uh, rip away my ticket, I'm going to tell everybody that, that you urinated on my porch. And he's like, okay. You know, so he, he said, you know, it, it helps the good police officers. Uh, and, and she ended up with another charge, by the way, because it was recorded on tape. But I mean, I think there's things that we can do, uh, you know, the, the chokehold ban. I, I, you know, you talk to, to the law enforcement agencies that, that uh, in Jefferson County that I've spoken with, they don't do that anyway. Um, but do you want to take that away from, from a, a, an officer who may be fighting for his life? I'm not sure. These are kind of the discussions that we have. I think Senator Wangard and Representative Ott have some ideas that certainly uh, are worth pursuing. So I look forward to, to what comes from this task force if we can somehow get politics out of it. I don't know if that's possible in this in this environment right now. The governor's uh, proposal for a People's Maps Commission to draw the next set of congressional and legislative district lines. Uh, your response? It, it, you saw by the makeup of the task or of his commission, there, there is no take, there is no nonpartisan person. Um, it, it's our job. Um, I get people are frustrated, particularly on the western part of my district. Uh, people, people think, you know, it, that that there was some some you know that, that we should go the, the route of the Iowa model or things like that but the constitution says it's our job and we're we're accountable and you know when, when it comes to forming a commission that supposedly is made up of of people that don't have any views on politics when they're appointed by politicians is is just I, I think fallacy to me um as states around Wisconsin legalize medical and recreational marijuana, has, has your position evolved? It, it, it actually has evolved greatly in the last uh, seven years, Steve. I went from absolutely not to looking at my, I remember we did uh, legislative surveys the first, my first term, and a lot of them was standard questions, but I threw that in there just out of curiosity. And, and then my very first term, it came back over 60% in favor of medical marijuana. And so I became a, a bit of a proponent at that and, and even looked at, at uh, different bills around the country. And then when you talk to the medical society, they say, look, there's no such thing as medical marijuana. They don't, they don't know how to prescribe it. They don't know what the dosage is. The doctors want, if you talk to the medical society and you talk to doctors, they want information um, that only really pure legalization could come from. So, and you look at Minnesota, which has a, a, a plan that I know some of our colleagues in the legislature were looking at uh, modeling a, a proposed bill in our state after, um, which was like uh, medical marijuana, but you, not smoking. It would have to be either uh, pill form, pill, whatever. But if you look at Minnesota's plan, they have only like 20 doctors in the entire state prescribing it. Doctors don't want any part of it. I get the compassion part of it. I get that, you know, we should help people that that have uh, these debilitating conditions and where it might come to help. So I, I'm more almost to the line of, well, let's look at full legalization. I'm not there yet by any means. I think we have a perfect opportunity right now, Steve, to, to study what other states are doing. Um, I know we're behind on our neighbors on some of this, but let's just see what they're doing, seeing how they're doing it to avoid any pitfalls. 
rather than ju jump in because there's been a hodgepodge of, of plans, whether it's full legalization, medical marijuana of some form in other states. Let's see where we're at and, and just hit the brakes on it a little bit some more, unfortunately. Because Wisconsin is a high property tax state, school districts and local governments have been living with caps and limits on property tax levies for more than 20 years. If you're reelected on voting on the next state budget, should those caps and limits stay in place? Yeah, I, I believe they should. I, I'm a believer of those caps. Um, it, I, I realize that there's there's some some valves there for particularly school districts that have utilized um, it, it quite creatively in some cases to 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 get some more funding. Um, the, that's that's an, an option to them, but I believe the cap should stay in place. Yeah. What about um, bills like Representative Goyke's that would give uh, cities, towns, villages, new uh, uh, options, revenue options to lessen the reliance on property tax. Uh, uh, Evans' bill, if a referendum passes, Milwaukee could levy a half cent sales tax. Is it time to give local governments new revenue options to l maybe lessen their reliance on property taxes? I'm open to discussions on this, particularly when it comes perhaps to some local transportation issues and things like that. But my fear is, um, how is this going to be structured so it's not just to spend, um, that it's not gonna go to, to some reckless spending? Um, it, it would have to be narrowly constructed. I'd, I'd have to really take a look at it, but I don't wanna rule anything out. I know, I, I believe some of the folks in the city of Milwaukee are are um, are having, showing in good faith, some of the, the need that they, they think they have for this. So I'm, I don't wanna shut the door on them, including, you know, some of the, the business leaders there say, maybe this is time. So I don't want to shut the door on them, but it would have to be really narrowly structured to get my support. The, the governor's appeal to raise a gas tax last year, we're at 30.9 cents a gallon, hasn't been raised 10 or 12 years. Uh, could you consider raising the gas tax or is that a dead issue given all the caucus discussion? Well, I, I think just on politically, uh, it's a dead issue. And also just when it comes to reality, it is. I mean, when you look at uh, it, that that's a, a fading, fading revenue source that is not long-term sustainable. That's why I, I've been in favor of open road tolling. I, I think that's the long-term solution. We bought a little bit of time in the last budget, uh, you know, basically through this budget cycle where, where we gave a, a big increase in transportation, the biggest, I, I think, in, in certainly the, since I've been around. And I think that bought us a little bit of time on revenue. Um, but I don't think it's a gas tax is a, is a wise idea, a gas tax increase. When a school district or local government plans a major public works project, should they have to give a preference to Wisconsin businesses? I hope they would, but I don't think we should mandate it. Uh, I, I think that perhaps I, I, I would, I think I'd be open to perhaps looking at incentivizing it, but I, I think when you get to some, some of these artificial um, things that may feel good, I, I, when it comes to, to handcuffing um, some local decisions, uh, I, I don't think that's a very good idea, but I, I think uh, I think it's happening some, somewhat naturally um, in, in, the, in, the, in the bid process. Um, but I don't think we should mandate it, no. Finally, uh, differences between you and your opponent on uh, November 3. Well, I have two opponents. They're both progressives from Dane County. Um, the, the differences are extremely clear. We don't need to, to really go down on them. I, I mean, uh, the, the contrast is, is, is very, very clear. Um, and, and hopefully the, the voters will, will like the way that uh, I've been representing them in, in the last eight years and, and continue to give me the opportunity and the privilege to do so. Like I said, we don't need to, to, to mark down the list because it would be a long, long <laughs> list. Of those differences. Okay. State Representative John Jagler of Watertown is a Republican seeking re-election in the 37th Assembly District. The election is November 3. John, thank you for talking to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Take care. Campaign 2020 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Quick Trip, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, and Wisconsin Operating Engineers Local 139.